The Lord is good. And I'm glad that uh, I can say that with honesty and sincerity. God is good whether I realize it or not or whether I think so or not. God is good. You have your Bible open to the book of Genesis chapter 2. And on Sunday mornings, I told you last Sunday, being the first Sunday of the new year, on Sunday mornings for quite some time, we're just going to navigate our way through with God's help through the book of Genesis. Now, we'll not cover every verse, but we will top some trees and highlight some things from most, if not every chapter. Some we'll spend a little more time in. Some we'll just kind of, as I said, just pass over and give the main truth. And then in Sunday night services, we're going to go the same way through the book of the Revelation. We're going to get the beginning and the end. Amen. <laughs> just the way God gave it. Last week, we talked about creation, the seven solar days, the 24-hour periods of creation that God has made it. We're not here by some galactic accident, you know, some big bang, or uh, we didn't wash up on the shore or some tadpole and become a monkey, or, you know. Uh, God created the heaven and the earth. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And then we get to chapter 2. And God begins to take what happened in chapter 1 and becomes a little more detailed in the process. And he says, I'm going to kind of elaborate and define some of those moves for you. And he begins chapter 7 by saying that he took a rest on the seventh day. Now, some of our Jewish friends still take that rest. We know as believers that God wants us to rest. He wants our bodies to rest. God, there's, listen, the Bible's always right. You need rest. Let me say that again. You need rest. Everyone needs a time of rest. Now, that, not seven-day rest. Amen. <laughs> now, some of you want to rest all day, every day, but that's not what the Scripture said. I didn't, I, I didn't mean to say some of you. Some folks, maybe not some of you, I don't know. But uh, we all need rest. And when God rests, it was not really a, a, a rest from being fatigued. It was a cessation. It was a time when God said, okay, I'm going to cease my creative work. And you find that in chapter number 2 in verse number 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. Finished. God's creative work. Now God's redemptive work in the mind of God before eternity. Listen, eternity passed. Before the time ever began, God had finished his redemptive work. And Jesus on the cross declared it finished when he said, It is finished. And so can I say that the creative work of God is done and that the redemptive work, now what do I mean by redemptive? That means that God has paid the price for the sin of every individual and that all that would come to him by faith can have their sin forgiven. I'm glad that it's finished. You say, well, I'd like to reopen that account and, and, and add something to it. Price has been paid right. in full. Amen. Amen. So there's nothing you or I can do to add to that. Just enjoy it, receive it, and thank God for it. Then it says, if you follow on down, it says, kind of reviewing the generations in verse number 4, the heavens and the earth, and it talks about in verse number 4, the Lord God. And we talked about this. In chapter 1, it's God, Elohim, the Creator. But now it's the Lord God. It's the God who's going to get personal. It's Yahweh. He's Jehovah. And the reason that it is mentioned here is because now man has been created. And God is going to have a personal relationship. He's going to have fellowship with man and allow man to fellowship with him. And so the Lord God, in verse number 4, the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. And then you move down to verse number 7, and we're going to get into, I want you to write this word down. We're going to get into some things psychologically. You say, oh, wow, psychological. Wow, that's, that's great. Well, the world's psychological position is way off, all right? The, 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 the world system, they, they'll tell you anything from you, you come from a tadpole, from a monkey, and that uh, you're an accident. I want to tell you something. I want you to look right up here at the preacher real quick. I'm not, I want to get personal here with you, but I do want you to understand something. Don't know how you came into this world as far as, you know, how the plan went about, but you're not an accident. So my parents don't, don't love me. I've been adopted. You're still not an accident. You see, God has you here for a purpose. 
And I want you to listen very carefully this morning. We're going to talk a little bit about that purpose, okay? You are here by the divine hand of God, and He has a purpose and a plan for your life. And so no one is here by accident, whether it come from, from the scientific foolishness of uh, Big Bang Theory or whether it come through, well, you know, uh, you wasn't wanted and, and you were born as an accident by, by some uncaring and unthinking parent. Uh, no one is an accident. There are no accidents with God. There's only appointments. And I want you to understand that, okay? So you look at verse number 7, and God says, I want to tell you how you got here. So I want you to listen carefully. We're going to talk about psychological things, all right? Now, people think, well, you know, man, man, you, you're here, you live, you die, you're gone. That's not so. Then what? You see, the Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die. But after this, after death, absolutely. After this, the judgment. See, we're all going to stand before God. The lost are going to stand before God at the white throne judgment. And the saved, we who have received Christ, are going to stand before God at the bema or the judgment seat of Christ. Every man has his date with God to stand before him personally. And the Bible says here that the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. That's the way it happened, brethren. So don't you, don't you get to thinking now, that don't, don't you envision in your mind a little tadpole, you know, flipping around out of water on the sand and getting a body and then it just somehow evolved into something else and something else and a monkey and soup and uh, no. Right here's the way it happened. The Lord God, the potter, the divine potter, Formed man like clay. The word Adam, in which he named this man, means red man. He formed, that's what the word Adam means. He formed Adam from the dust of the earth. By the way, that's where your body's going back to. If you'll turn over to chapter 3 just for a moment, we'll see what God told Adam after sin had entered into the picture. In verse number 19 of chapter 3, he said, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return into the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and into dust shalt thou return. That's your body. That's your body. But watch what God does here in, as we go back to chapter 2, verse number 7. The Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground. That's his body. Now they tell me, and I've done a little research and reading, there's about 15 or 16 chemical components that that man is made up of, that God chose, they all go back, find their way back to the dust of the ground. Did you know that what it takes to make up your body and my body, as a body now, the average size body, you can put in about two Walmart shopping bags. <laughs> That's right. God did that. You say, well, I'm not worth a whole lot. Oh, we're not through yet. That's your body. Now watch what God does when he makes your body. Look in verse number 7. It says that he formed man of the dust of the ground, but he wasn't through. He breathed into his nostrils. Whoa. So God breathed. That's what we get our word inspiration, life. We talk about the inspiration of the Bible, the inspiration of the Scripture. It simply means God breathed. Holy men of God spake. As God moved, as he breathed upon them. God breathed life into this form that he made. When he formed man, his body, he was not a living soul. You see, if you'll read that verse very carefully, it didn't say the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and he became a living being. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that he formed man of the dust of the earth and then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. God gave man a capacity for God. You see, when God formed man, he made him from the dust of the earth, which gave him a, a earth consciousness, a consciousness with the world. And he gave him senses that he might go and navigate through life in this world. We call them the five senses of smell and touch and taste and hearing and smelling. And so that's the body. But that's not all that man is made up of. Man is a triune being. Because as I said, and you look in chapter 1 and verse number 26, God said, let us make man in our image. Let us. That's speaking of the triune God, the Elohim. 
the triune God, not three gods, but the one God who manifests himself in, unto us in three personalities, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Somebody say, well, you know, I, I don't believe that, um, that uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost are eternal together. You know, the, the Son had his, had his beginning uh, at some point. No, that's not so. What's the first person of the Godhead called? Father. In order to be a father, what do you have to have? How long has he been the father? Okay, then that's how long he's had a son. Somebody say amen with me. See, so you, you don't want to get confused by listening to, to false teaching and say, well, you know, man is a dichotomy. Uh, we, 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 we are just, you know, we live, we, we think, we die, and it's over. Not so. See, we do have an earth consciousness. We, are, we have an earth consciousness that navigates us through life in this world. But then we have a God consciousness. And that God consciousness is found right here in verse number 7 where it says that God breathed into its nostrils the breath of life. You see, you have an ever-dying soul. Your spirit has a capacity to fellowship with God and to worship God. This is what separates us from all else of God's creation. You following me? We're different. We're different. God never said this about any other uh, part of his creation. So we have his, his body, and then we have his spirit. He breathed unto his nostrils, and then we have his soul. And man became a living soul. There's your triune being. That's what we are. That is Bible psychology, all right? You listen to the world. The world says, well, you know, you get here by some accident. This is their psychology. This is the, the, this is the spirit of Antichrist. You, 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 you come here and you live a little bit and then you die and it's all over. That's not so. That's not so. And so I want you to really give that thought. God made man to fellowship with man. And we'll see that here in just a few moments. And man is going to live forever. I opened up the Sunday school by saying that this world is not our home. We're just passing through. We're just passing through, brethren. This world's not our home. But I also want to say that it's no man's home. Because no man is going to live on this earth forever. And I know we as Christians, when we sing that song, we have a better place in mind. We're talking about going to heaven. And brethren, I'm here to tell you that if you're saved in the grace of God, you're going to heaven. Amen. You're going to heaven when you leave this life. But everyone's going to leave this life, you see. Everyone's going to leave this life. And when you leave this life, you either go to heaven or you'll go to hell. But no one's going to live forever on this earth. But because God breathed into that first man into its nostrils a breath of life. He became a, a living soul and is going to live somewhere forever. Now you get to choose where. And I'm glad God gave man a choice. We're going to talk about that a little later too. So here it is. All right. God made man. Made him from the dust of the earth. About 15 or 16 chemical components. And you say, well, that's, that's you know, boy, we're not much. I want you to just kind of take your finger and mark about a one square inch place on the back of your hand right there. Just kind of do it with your fingernail there. All right, within that one square inch of the normal human hand, there's about three million cells. What do you think about that? About 15 oil glands, about 100 sweat glands, about 25 nerve endings. I mean, the psalmist David said, thou art fearfully and wonderfully made. So don't you take what I've said about the body being just, you know, a, a hunk of dirt, you know, about 15, 16 chemical components. See, God made us, uh, we, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. You begin to read about the mind of man, my goodness. You talk about a computer, the mind of man. You, you think about just the, the eye, one eye, the things that God has done when he made man, when he breathed into his nostrils and man became a living soul. What a complex being God has made you and I. And so don't you buy into this thing, well, you know, uh, we, we, we're, we're just uh, on the, the, the uh, level of an animal. Well, some folks live like it, but that doesn't mean we are. You see, your body is kind of like the lower story. And then you have your soul. That's your emotion. That's, see, that's your ability to choose, and that's how you carry out choice, emotion. Then you have your spirit. That's that community, uh, that, that uh, ability to communicate with God. Our body makes us earth conscious or world conscious. You with me? Five senses. Our souls makes us 
self-conscious. But our spirit makes us God-conscious. And I'm glad that God did that for us. We're complex. See, God made us that way. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. And yet the psalmist said in Psalm 103, verse 14, that God remembers our frame, that we are but of the dust of the earth. I'm so thankful that God has mercy on us, aren't you? Amen. I'm so thankful for that. Now listen, when I begin to study this, this part of the Scripture, it reminds me of what a great God I have. Right. What a great God I have. So I want to move now from, and, and there's much more in this, but I'm just kind of moving through. I want to navigate. I want to close in chapter 3. So I'm navigating through chapter 2 a little bit, okay? So you, you have what would we call maybe the psychological part or the looking at things psychologically. Then you get down in verse number 8 through verse number 15, and we're going to look at things just a little bit environmentally. All right? Now, God, when he made man, he was very cautious of where he put man. And so he planted a garden, and he placed man in that garden. And some people have this erroneous thing, well, you know, if it wouldn't have been for Adam, we'd have all just been kind of laid back in some lush garden and never working or going about life. That's not true at all. As a matter of fact, when you read the Bible, you'll find that in verse number 8 that God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and he put the man that he had formed in that garden. And if you look at verse 15, if you read on down, it talks about the trees that God put in there, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the rivers that he planted in there. Just a beautiful home that God gave Adam. And then in verse number 15, it says this. It says, And the Lord God took the man... And put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Now, what is God doing here? Now, I want you to listen very carefully. What God is doing here is he's given man purpose. See, he's given man the ability to know purpose and achievement and work and accomplishment and fulfillment. And so he's saying, what I want you to do is I want you to do something with your life. I, I don't want you just to, to, to have nothing to do and to, to, to think that life is just a big party and entertainment and amusement. No, God said, I want you to know what it is to have fulfillment and accomplishment. And so he said, I want you to, to be in the garden and to carry about things and do things. One of the greatest things that you'll ever do or teach your children to do is to work so that they can know what it is to have achievement and fulfillment in life. Because that is the first steps of knowing purpose and meaning to life. And so that's what God did with Adam here. You see that? You see what he done in verse 15? Look at it one more time. The Lord God took the man and he put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. He said, hey, here's you something to do so that you can know purpose, so that you can know fulfillment and achievement and accomplishment. It's a great thing to accomplish things in life. You know, some of the most, some of the most um, as far as confident people and some of the most motivated and driven people are people that understand accomplishment and achievement in life. You find me a person that knows little to nothing about accomplishment and achievement, they're not, not very driven. They're not very motivated. And so a good thing to do is to follow God's plan here. Follow God's plan. Then second, or, or thirdly, I'm sorry, we navigate on down, so we have the psychologically, then we have environmentally, and then you get down and, and we're going to look at some theologically. You say, well, what's that big word mean? Well, it just means the study of God. And I want you to look at what God does here in verse number 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now let's look at some theology here. What's happening here? God is saying, I'm setting some boundaries. See, we, we live in a day where people say, Well, you know, everything is relative. Relativity, you know. Situation ethics, right? It's right if I think it's right, and it's wrong if I think it's wrong. There are no absolutes, they say. You know, there's no absolute truth. or there, there, There's no way you can know for sure that something's right or something's wrong. It might be right for you, but it might be wrong for him. Well, that's just not so. That's just not the way God made it. God said, if I said it's right, it's right. And if I say it's wrong, it's wrong. So we learn some things about God and man here, and I want you to listen carefully. Here's what we learn. God has reserved the right for himself to command man. Look what he did here in verse number 16. And the Lord God commanded the man. 
See, I'm not, I'm not in charge. God's in charge. We're not in charge, brethren. God's in charge. And that's what's wrong with this mixed up world we live in. Man says, I'm going to be in charge. I'm going to call the shots. God's not going to tell me what to do. Well, God already has told you what to do. And me too. The answer is not, uh, is God going to tell us what to do? The answer is, are we going to do what God said to do? And so God has already given his commandments. God has already said what we're to do. And so here God told the man, he said, I'm going to set some boundaries and some limitations. By the way, boundaries and the limitations, they're good for us. They're like guardrails. They help us from going over the cliff. You know why? Because without God's assistance, we'd all just run headlong, go over a cliff. We're just kind of wired that way, especially since sin entered into the world. Somebody say amen with me. You take God out of the picture and man just self-destructs. I said it in Sunday school. The last thing, there's a lot of people that think that they want God to leave them alone. That's the last thing you want in your life until you draw your last breath. You never want God to leave you alone. You better be careful about making that statement. I just wish God would leave me alone. I just wish that preacher down there at Fellowship Baptist Church just leave me alone. I wish him, the folks down there at the church just leave me alone. You don't want God to leave you alone. God leaves you alone, you're going to be in a big mess. And there are people that God has left alone. He's turned them over to a reprobate mind, and we've seen the end of that. Big mess. And so God, number one, we find something out about God. What is it? That God reserves the right to command. Why? God knows what's best. And he said, now listen, Adam, look at it, verse number 16. He said, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. I, I want to just say that's maximum liberty. Why do folks, when they look at this, this section of Scripture, always say, well, God shouldn't have kept Adam from that tree. It was just one. <laughs> I mean, come on, folks. Right? I was visiting with that couple yesterday, uh, and, and I, I was talking a little bit about this, and, and something came to my mind, and I remember when I was a child, and perhaps you'll remember this too. See, see, <laughs> I grew up on the different side of the tracks. We used to play in the street, amen? <laughs> I mean, and my mom used to have to tell us, you can play in the yard. You can play in the neighbor's yard, but you cannot play in the street. Now, it's pretty bad when somebody has to tell you not to play in the street. Say amen with me. But, I mean, we, we had to repeatedly be warned. You cannot play in the street. Somebody's going to be wearing you as a hood ornament. You cannot play in the street. This is what God's telling Adam. Adam, you can't play in the street. You've got this whole garden. You've got all these trees. But you stay away from that tree. I reserve the right to tell you stay away from that tree. But we learned that about God, that God has the right and the ability to command man. But I'm going to show you something else that we learned. Watch this very carefully. Look, if you would, down at your Bible in verse number um, 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. God said, you can't do it. But I made you a free moral agent. I made you a person of choice and a free will. You're going to get to make the choice. How do you know that? Well, look what he said next. He said, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, but in the day that thou eatest. In other words, you can't eat if you want to now. If you, if you, if you make the decision to eat, you can eat. But I'm going to tell you the consequences if you do. Right? You see man's ability to choose there? See, God is sovereign. God can do whatever he chooses to do. And God commands man. But God didn't make it to where you have to do what he said. God made you a free moral agent. He made me a free will. That's called the free will of man. We believe in the free will of man. Amen? I'm so glad God made me that way. I'm so glad God made folks that way, aren't you? Now, sometimes I look at folks and I say, you know, God should have took your free will, free will away a long time ago. Amen? <laughs> sometimes I feel that way about myself. I just wish God would take this choice thing away from me. Every husband in here knows what I'm talking about. Amen. Because <laughs> you have to make choices for you and your wife sometimes. Where do you want to go eat? I I'm not even going to get into that. <laughs> so, God gave you the ability to choose. All right? And he said, listen, I'm telling you, don't eat of that tree. But if you do, you have a choice. You see what God's saying here? God's saying... I have the right to command you. I'm going to command you not to eat. But you have the will to choose. If you do eat, 
thou shalt surely die. Is that what the, bu the book says, brethren? The book's always right. The book's always right. People say, well, you know, folks just can't help it. They were born into that. Well, we're all born into sin, but we still have an ability to choose. Let, let me help you out right here, okay? Listen, some of you come from very difficult background situations. Some of you. And, and some of you feel like, you know what, it's, this, it's a, there's, this is a large hill in front of me to climb. This is a mountain, preacher. You get to climbing. Don't you use the situation that you are at in life to cause you to get this mindset, well, I can't do anything with my life. I'm trapped. No, you work hard. You put God first. You put God on the throne of your heart, and you work, and God will make something great out of your life. It may not be the American quote-unquote dream, but I'll tell you what it will be. It'll be the will of God and the purpose that God has for your life. And you can't get any better than that. So we see psychologically, God made man of the dust of the earth, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And then we see environmentally, God put him in a great environment. And he said, I want you to work, and he said, I want you to... to to dress and keep the garden. I want you to find purpose and meaning in life. And then he gave them some prohibitions. Theologically, God said, now listen, I have the right to tell you what to do. And if you're sitting here this morning, and I don't know, listen, I don't know what goes through people's hearts and minds. I know there's a devil, there's an enemy that always wants to try to get us to question God's word. You may be sitting here and the devil may be saying, well, you know, uh, I, I don't have to do what God says or God's not going to tell me what to do. It would, the sooner that we get to this place in life that God has every right to tell me what to do and it's going to be best for me to follow God's word and to do what God says to do, the better off our lives are going to be. We can rebel and fight against that and listen, you're looking at your preacher, I've been saved for 35 years and a lot of those years I've been kicking and screaming, God's had to just deal with me because I didn't want to do what God said do. And I'm getting to the place in my life, and I'm sad that I'm almost 60 years old before I've learned this. It's just good to do what God said do. Amen. Just do what God said do. Can I speak to a 16-year-old, a 12-year-old this morning, as, as nearly a, a 59-year-old man, and say, just do what God said do. Don't wait till you get on the back side of your life to learn this great lesson in life. Just do what God said do. You'll never go wrong doing what God said do. You say, well, preacher, I don't understand it. Well, there's some things in life we don't understand. But if God said do it, do it. You'll be glad you did one day. And God said, Adam, don't you eat. Now, don't you eat of that tree. He said, for the day that thou eatest thereof, he said, thou shalt surely die. We know how that turned out. So here we sit, all of us, sinners. And I'll get into that in just, just a moment. Final thing in chapter 2. The Bible says in verse number 18, through the remainder of the chapter, after God dealt with things psychologically, environmentally, theologically, he began to deal with things domestically. And I'm glad that we don't have to get uh, God's plan for marriage and the home and the family from the world. What a mixed up situation that is. God set it down right here in his word in the very beginning. The book of Genesis means beginning's origin, and I'm glad that God set it right here. And here's what he said. When you go back in chapter 1, and I'll just go back there just for a moment and look, if you would, in verse number 4, and God saw the light that it was good. And you look down in verse number 10, the latter part of verse number 10 of chapter 1, and God saw that it was good. The last part of chapter uh, number 1, verse number 12 says, and God saw that it was good. And then you get over to chapter 1, the latter part of verse number 18, and God saw that it was good. And verse number 21 of chapter 1, and God saw that it was good. Verse number 25, the last little phrase there, and God saw that it was good. And then after God had made man in his own image in verse 26 and 27, the latter part of verse number 31 says, after God saw everything that he made, behold, it was very good. Now, if it pleases God, surely to heaven it ought to please you and me. God said it's good. Everything that God did and everything that God does is good. But now God comes along and he says in chapter number 2 and verse number 18, and the Lord God said, it is not good. And I'm glad that God saw something that needed to be tweaked. Amen. Amen. 
I'm glad that God said, you know, I, I, I see something not like God forgot anything. He said, now Adam's ready. He said, but there's one thing that's lacking with Adam. He said, Adam needs him a companion. The Bible says in Proverbs 18, 22, he that findeth a wife findeth a good thing. And all the husbands in the building said, Amen. Oh, come on, say it like you love her. Amen. Amen. Thank God for a good wife. Oh, my. Where would we be without good ladies in this old world? Thank God for the crown jewel of God's creation. I believe the most beautiful thing that God created was not in the garden in the form of a tree or a river or a bank or a, 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 a hill or uh, some decorative thing that, that God had put there for Adam. I think the, the greatest thing, that the most beautiful thing that God created wasn't created for Adam. It was created out of Adam for Adam. It was woman. My, how God looked down. And Let me just say this before I get started on this few things I'm going to say about this section. Marriage is not man's idea. Okay, see, see, see men, uh, men, men need to leave this alone. <laughs> got it really mixed up. We live in an age, we got men wanting to marry men, women wanting to marry women, men wanting to marry three or four women. It's coming. There's going to be people marrying their animals before long. Now, I've heard folks have already done it, but I don't know that that's been, as far as, I don't know if it's being accepted, but it's coming. So just go ahead and just listen. If you haven't heard it, you heard it here first. <laughs> it's coming. Why? Because man has no idea uh, what, what God wants in marriage. Man has no idea what he needs in marriage. Man needs to leave that alone. Say amen with me now, folks. I'm not saying hate people and, 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 and mock people. I'm saying that man needs to leave the institution of marriage alone. I could go into great detail here and tell you that the, the, the evolutionists have no answer for male and female. They have no answer for it. But Jesus does. Matthew 19. In the beginning, God made them male and female. See, Jesus got the answer. The Bible has the answer. Evolutionist theories. Theories at best. Mixed up ones at that. God said it's not good that man should be alone. Look at it, verse 18 of chapter 2. He said, it is not good that the man should be alone. There's some things that we need to gather from this that's going to help us. Now, many of you have already gotten married and and you're married, and I, I pray you're happily married. If you're not, then I pray that you will be. You can be, I'll tell you that. Now, some of you have yet to be married. And so I want you to listen and see what God does here. In verse number 18, it says, I will make him and help me for him. God said, I'm going to choose who Adam's going to have as his help me. Now, young folks, let God do the choosing. Say, I'm going to go get me a good man. Well, wait a minute now. Let God find you a good man. There's plenty out there. Amen. And the same for the young man and the young, uh, as far as finding the good young lady. God, you get God involved in it, and you'll get the right one. And it says here in verse number 19, Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. That is astounding to me. <laughs> I've worked in pest control for many years. And I've studied about every kind of bug you can study. And I'm telling you, there are all kinds of little critters and creepy, crawly things out there. And at somewhere in, in, in back in the beginning, Adam said, ant, spider, cricket. You know, <laughs> I, yeah. now, I don't believe that, preacher. I do. Why? Well, because the Bible says so. You say, well, I don't think I could have done that. That's why God didn't ask you to do it. He asked Adam to do it. Amen. <laughs> Sooner or later, we're going to get this thing down. Amen. If God wants something done, he'll give you the ability to do it. If he wants you to do it. If he doesn't, he'll give whoever he wants the ability to do it to do it. Say amen with me. We complicate simplicity. We're masters of that. God simplifies the complex for us. And I'm thankful that he does. Now, look what happened here. And so here, here, here's Adam in the garden. I, and I, listen, I'm, it, just allow me just for a few moments. I'm getting ready to close. But just for a few moments, just allow me to, to think, you know, the way I want to think, all right? You say, that's a dangerous preacher. Well, <laughs> you know, could be. But I see Adam in the garden, and God's saying, Adam, just, you know, listen, you just call him what you want to call him. I've given you dominion. Hey, you, you call him what you want to call him. 
And then he starts bringing the animals to him. In verse number 20 it says, And Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the fowl of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an help meet for him. Now what is God doing here? God saw that it was not good for Adam to be alone. I don't think Adam had gotten it yet. Right? Man. <laughs> was that a young lady never been married? <laughs> Wondering if her boyfriend's ever going to get it? Amen. <laughs> I think somebody got passed up at Christmas on an engagement ring. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Listen to me now. So what happened? What's God doing here? Can I tell you that God is, listen, God is so merciful this way. It, it, it just challenges my heart to know that God would do this for us. God is creating a desire in the heart of Adam. Adam, I see that this is not good for you. I want you to see it, though. Adam, I want you to see it. And so he brings the animals to, to, to Adam, and Adam again say, you know, Mr. You know, Hippopotamus, Mr. Hippopotamus. Now, man, don't, you know, <laughs> stay away from that term around the house. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, Mr. Giraffe, Mr. Giraffe. And, and just right on down the line, you know, he's naming the animals. And then God, you know, said in verse number, uh, 20, verse number 20 that Adam... Uh, but for Adam, there was not found a help me for him. I think Adam finally realized, hey, he has a mate, he has a mate, he has a mate, and he has a mate. They are all uglier than I am. I ought to have a mate. Say amen. Yeah. Hey, listen. A help meet for him. That means someone suitable, someone comparable, someone that Adam could share life with intimacies with joys and and desires and burdens and trials aren't you glad that that god made it this way i bless the god of heaven for this brethren plus we get to we get to to, to be intimate and to bring forth children and and get to that that experience of having children and rearing children and 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 training them and it's just it's just a wonderful thing what a great thing god did here and sometimes we just go through life and take it for granted. Like, well, you know what? Th th this has always been. No, it hasn't. This is where it started right here. And God said, Adam, I want you to see you have a need. Can I tell you, if you start sensing a need in your life, it may be that God is creating that in your life. God's seen it many. Listen, God's seen it eons ago in your life. God's seen it in my life. And he said, you know, this is what you need, Dale. And I'm not getting it, and then God will begin to work things out to where I can see that I need it, and I'll think, I came up with a great idea. And God's just saying, uh, he's not, is he ever going to get it? Right? Right? So you remember now, behind every good idea, there's a God that's putting you in situations so that you can come to the place to where he's already seen that you need to be. And that's what's happening here. And then God put Adam in verse number 21. He caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. I know there's some people back in the Civil War days that wished that some people would have interpreted the Scripture on anesthesia and putting people in a deep sleep before they started cutting on them uh, before they did. The turn of the 19th century, right? A lot of people have been cut on before they put, got put in a deep sleep. Maybe God back in the very beginning was trying to give man a hint and said, you go to cutting on a man, you need to put him to sleep. Somebody say amen now. You say, well, he didn't put him to sleep. Well, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on him. He didn't cut on him. Well, I think he did because the Bible says in the latter part of verse number 21 that he closed up the flesh instead thereof. So I think he got to open it up to close it up. Yeah. And so you know the story. God took a rib. He made a woman. And he brought the woman. There's just so much beauty in this. I'm not going to go through it. He brought the woman to man. That's why that the groom don't walk down the aisle and say, here comes the groom. See, God always has the woman going to the man. That's why the bride walks down the aisle. Look at what it says here. Look at it. In verse number 22, And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Yeah, that's why the father always brings the bride. Our Western culture is just steeped in Bible teaching. Amen. It is. Our forefathers wasn't Christians. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> and so God 
created and, and, and officiated the first marriage ceremony. And he said, Therefore shall a man, in verse 24, leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, verse 25 says, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. This being that God made, Adam, in verse number 23, said this is a woman because she was taken out of man. And that's what woman means from the wound, not womb. That's where a man's taken. But the woman was taken from the wound of man. And so he said she, he, she's going to be called woman. And then if you turn over to chapter number 3 just for a moment, he said... In verse number 20, Adam called his wife's name Eve, right? Is that what the Bible says? Yes. Why? Because she became a mother. She's the mother of all living. God said, now you're going to be a mom. And, of course, we know in the next chapter she does, right? So there's woman, then there's Eve. But what did God call this great creation? Look in chapter 5 of Genesis and the Bible says this is the book of the generation of Adam. Chapter 5, verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam and the day that God created man in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam. See, God called this new creation Adam. Adam called her Eve. Adam called her woman. Why did God call her Adam? Because he said, now you twain shall be one flesh. All right? And that's the way God intends all marriage to be, that the twain shall be one flesh. The Bible says that Adam called her woman. Read it carefully now. Adam called her Eve, but God called her, in verse number 2 of chapter 5, he blessed them, he created them, he blessed them, and he called their name Adam. As we close this morning, you can go ahead and stand to your feet. I'm going to use a term that one of our visiting evangelists used. He actually preached a message called, So Far, So Good. Remember De Brother Dwayne Moore preaching that message? What a great message. It's just stuck with me. And that's what we have here. So far, so good. God's created the heavens and the earth and... God's, you know, he's made man. He, he formed him from the dust of the earth and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. And God put him to sleep, took from his side a beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus here, but I'll not get into that. But he, he, he took from his side a rib. Pe people come to me all the time. Where, where do you think Cain got his wife? You know, I, I think he married his sister. <laughs> You mean a man marry his sister? Well, Adam married his rib. <laughs> right? Is that what the Bible says? So don't get nervous when God does it. It's going to be okay. God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are, are higher than our thoughts. We just need to leave these things up to God. and Let's concentrate on the, the, the real question, the real need. So here's man in paradise, so far so good. It's been given this one prohibition. Next week, we're going to flip the page. And in chapter 3, so far so good becomes paradise lost. Sin enters into the picture. It's just a terrible thing. But I'm glad that God didn't give up on man after he sinned. God went to him and he said, Adam, where art thou? God knew where he was physically, but God wanted to know where he was spiritually. God wants to know where you are spiritually too. Now, God knows he wants you to know. God knew where Adam was spiritually. He just wanted Adam to know. I wonder if you know where you are spiritually. Do you? Where do you stand before God? Do you belong to him? I mean, really. Has there ever been a time in your life that you trusted him as your personal savior? You realize you're a sinner. And... and if you got what you deserved, you'd die in that sin and go to hell. But God has had mercy 
And He commendeth His love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He was buried and He rose again the third day. And now if you will place your faith and trust in that finished work that Jesus has finished, you can be saved by His amazing grace. It's the only way to have your sin forgiven. And every person needs to have their sin forgiven. The guilt and the shame that sin brings is found in chapter 3 and all throughout the remainder of the Scripture. Perhaps you're bearing it today. You don't have to bear it any longer because Christ is a great sin-bearing Savior. He will cleanse you of your sin. And He will give you a new beginning if you will trust Him as your personal Savior. Let's bow our heads together. The pianist is going to begin to play. I want to talk to those of you that are here today and you say, Preacher, I'm a Christian.